Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the Tough Girl Podcast, please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast, and help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking with Maya Rose Craig, who is a prominent naturalist who will be sharing more about her passion for birds and conservation. I'm Maya Rose. I just turned 18, but I'm probably better known under the name of Bird Girl. And I do a lot of like blogging and tweeting and just campaigning to do with like various environmental issues. And yeah, I've been really lucky because I've got quite a big platform online now. And I just I, I talk about all the different stuff that I feel is really important, whether it's like global climate justice or diversity in the nature sector. Oh, that's fantastic. And we're going to be talking about all of those different things. But I'd love to know, how did you get your nickname, Bird Girl? Where did that come from? I came up with it when I was seven. And it was literally just because I needed an email address. And I thought it sounded a bit like a superhero, which I thought was really cool. And um, yeah, I just I thought it was really, really fun sounding. And then like years later, when I set up my blog, um, I put my email address in one of the suggested names was just Bird Girl for the blog. And I was like, actually, that's really cool. And it has stuck ever since. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I love it. I think it's amazing because you, you do have a passion for birding. And I'd love to know more about, you know, where did that passion come from? Both of my parents and my older sister are really into bird watching and the environment and twitching and all that type of thing. So they've been taking me out literally since I was a baby, you know, into the outdoors and I I grew up birding and it's always been something that's been a really important part of my life and um yeah I I still love it all these years later and I can't really imagine myself not birding for any reason in the future so I think it's going to carry on forever really. So there's a term there that you mentioned which I'm not familiar with which is twitcher what what does that mean? So twitching is basically when you get news that a really rare bird has turned up somewhere, like one that you maybe have never seen before in the UK, and quite often they've been they've flown in because of big storms um, and they didn't really even mean to turn up there, and you sort of race across across the country to try and like track this bird down and see it because it's going to be your only opportunity to ever have seen it in this country. So it can be like nationwide, or we do twitching down like at the local lake to try and see stuff that we've never seen at that particular lake before and for me it just adds a lot of like adrenaline and excitement to the whole bird watching thing really oh my god absolutely it's like (laughs) I love it yeah it's like a little bird treasure hunt I think it's great with bird watching like how does it actually work like is there I'm literally like this is going to show my ignorance is there a list that you go through and you tick off do you have to take a photo to say that you've seen it and and do you need to gather proof like what talk us more about the logistics of being a bird watcher well that's one of the reasons that birding's so great really because it's just very very flexible in how you want to do it like for some people like you don't even need to have binoculars or any special equipment or anything like that you can just go out and watch birds and you are bird watching and I think you know, some people like to do it very competitively and they have, they write down any new bird species they see and they keep a big list. While some people, it's just a lot more like it's something casual and something quite gentle to do in the outdoors. And I think there's a big range within the community, which is, is really cool. What type of bird watcher are you? Would you say that you're competitive? Are you not competitive? Are you more chilled? I think especially when I was younger, I was a very competitive birder. Um, me and my mum both are actually we both get a lot of satisfaction from like ticking things off the list and seeing new things and um, I don't know seeing really rare stuff that loads of other people haven't and I think um, it was sort of that competitiveness of it all that really like hooked me when I was a kid but I definitely think like as I get older just like the more chill 
gentle side of it all is like it's really starting to appeal and I just I'm starting to really enjoy just spending time outdoors um and it's I know it's it's really lovely you know because it's actually there's some big numbers on your website so you became the youngest person to see is it over five thousand birds basically I don't know if you know the exact number which is like apparently like half the but the world's birds you've seen them all uh, yeah, which was, yeah, that was so exciting when that happened. It was a slightly weird one in that we knew it was going to happen for quite a long time before it did. So it was like just waiting and waiting until we got up to that number. But it was, yeah, it was amazing. Where are some of the places that you've been um, with your family to go bird watching or some of your, yeah, some of your favourite places to go? Well, I'm really lucky because my family's been taking like I said my family's been taking me out since I was a kid but my family's also quite into like world birding which is basically traveling and bird watching at the same time so I've been I've been traveling a lot more than your average kid would have done and I've actually been to like all seven continents and stuff which is yeah just feel very lucky for it all it's it's really amazing um and so I've traveled all over the world and stuff but we also do a lot of birding in the UK And I think one of my favourite places will always be the Isles of Scilly down in Cornwall, just because it's somewhere I spent like so much of my childhood, like running all over the islands to try and see whatever new bird had popped up. And it was just, I don't know, it's it's somewhere that will always be really special to me, you know? Yeah. And I I don't even know if this is possible to answer this question, but do you have a favourite bird or does it sort of ebb and flow? I do, actually, yeah. Oh, I have a few. I haven't quite managed to narrow it down to one. But um, in the world, my favourite birds that I've seen have either got to be the southern cassowary, which is this like massive six foot tall bird that you get in Australia that like I think it looks like a dinosaur and it's got these like massive talons that could slice you up. And it's just, yeah, a really fantastic bird. Very exciting to see when it's about two foot taller than you. And My other favourite bird is probably the harpy eagle, which I saw last summer. And it's something I'd been trying to see for about 10 years at that point. And it's it's the biggest eagle in the world. It's like massive. And it's also absolutely gorgeous. And I was, yeah, so excited when I managed to catch up with it. Where did you see that bird, the eagle? Um, That was in Brazil, actually. Um, You get it a lot in um, like places in the Amazon in South America. But a lot of the time it's quite hard because they don't really spend a lot of their time like really out in the open. Um, and they're quite rare these days as well. I'd love to know, are there female role models in birding of who, who you look up to? To be honest, especially in the UK, there are not that many. Well, I mean, it's changing quite a lot. But especially when I was younger, there weren't many female birders like at all. Although like, you know, this new generation of people has a lot of um, female bird is in it which is really nice but I guess like in general someone who I think is really amazing is this really famous world birder called Phoebe Schnetzinger um, who she saw like a ridiculous amount of birds and she started really late like I think she started after she retired and she just spent all her time traveling around the world seeing as many birds as possible and yeah, she was just, she she was a really cool lady. Oh, she sounds awesome. Um, do you have a dream to continue on doing birding as, as sort of a career or go on to do further study with it? What's sort of, what's the goal? Well, this always surprises people a bit, but I'm not actually very um, like scientific minded in that like biology was never my best subject or anything. And I think for me, I really like I like birding in a very non-scientific way if that makes sense like it's very just like relaxing and spending time outside and just looking at things so I actually want to go study politics and international relations at uni which yeah completely unrelated but I think definitely I'm going to carry on bird watching and going out into nature as I get older and if I could find a job that in some way let me continue to spend time in the outdoors that would be fantastic yeah absolutely but I think actually going into politics and international relations will be fascinating because you are you're you're an activist you're an environmentalist you do you know a huge amount in the birding space as well as being you know campaigning for for race being a prominent UK race campaigner and I'd love to hear more about your your passion for the environment and conservation and what you've been doing in that space 
Yeah, so I've been doing I've been doing campaigning in terms of diversity in you know the countryside and the nature sectors for about five years now. Uh, so I started when I was thirteen, and I think the reason I got into it all was obviously like I'm half Bangladeshi. And growing up, I pretty much never saw anyone that looked like me except my mum and my sister going out into the countryside. And I thought that that was a real shame. And I couldn't really understand why. So I set up this organisation called Black to Nature that's all about um, trying to create this change. And we well, half the work we do is running this grassroots project out in um, Somerset that's all about giving ethnic minority kids from inner city Bristol the opportunity to come out into the countryside for a week for a weekend and really like experience and engage with nature for the first time and I, yeah I love doing their camps they're always really special and we do them with teenagers and primary age kids and it's always yeah it's always really sweet but the other side of the work we do is what it's campaigning basically and working with all these different organizations to try and um, encourage them to carry on trying to change things or even make them acknowledge the issue in the first place which is what we were doing for a really long time Um, and we've run a few conferences now called race equality in nature and yeah I don't know it's, it's been really hard work actually it's quite it's a bit of an issue that people don't didn't want to really talk about or acknowledge but I think things are slowly starting to change which is really nice really gratifying you know I love the, the the organization that you created when you're 14 black to nature tell us more about the nature camps because that must have just be um, amazing to give more children the opportunity to see to see wildlife and spend time in nature the nature camps were a weird one because we set it up we we started doing the camps before we set up the organization and originally I just wanted to spend like a weekend down on the Somerset levels spending time with other kids that were also really into nature but once I started like thinking about the whole race issue and the lack of diversity I did a bit of a 180 and I was trying to get ethnic minority kids to come on this camp even though it was like really last minute we managed it we got some kids in the end and it was really like well when they first turned up not gonna lie they did not want to be there like I think their mums had all made them come and it was like a nice weekend sending them away somewhere else and um it was really like oh my god what have we done they're gonna have a terrible time and therefore we're gonna have a terrible time but you know we were working hard just chatting and interacting with these kids and taking them out and you know by the end of the weekend every single one of them had engaged with nature in some shape or form and it was so special that these these kids that hadn't even wanted to be there at the start of the weekend had loosened up and really really enjoyed themselves and so we we do these camps every summer now it's just one night with the primary school kids because it's all quite intense for them they've never done anything like it before and last year we ended up running four camps in the end which was amazing and I I think for me like they're my favorite part of all the work I do because it's not like you know slogging my guts out trying to get organizations to I don't know start projects and campaigns and stuff it's like genuinely just working with quite often kids my age but also like these primary school children who are so cute most of the time um to try and you know give them this new experience do you feel a lot of responsibility as as almost like your popularity and, and fame has, has grown in the bird world in the bird world but also you know from your blog as well which I know has had like over four million hits and do you feel that pressure and how do you deal with that pressure um sometimes yeah it's it's very weird in the when I started my blog I didn't really expect anyone to read it like it was mainly just for me and you know, it, it was quite immediate where these views were just pouring in and people were interested in what I wanted to say. And I was only 12 at the time, I think. And I don't know, I, I still find it very weird that so many people care about what I have to say. And I guess for me, I'm just trying to make the most of this platform that I've been given because I I feel like social media is absolutely a lottery where it's not necessarily about 
the person who does the most work or has the best message that manages to get all the followers and I just I feel very lucky that things that I say are able to like go out into the world and be heard properly um it's it's very strange because it's been like that since I was about 14 but I try my best to be like do good things with it I suppose how do you deal with the challenges in that space you know around fighting racism trying to create equality in the in the environment that you're in how do you handle all of that I think because race was the issue that I decided I really wanted to champion and start a conversation about because it wasn't being talked about at all before I came onto the scene as far as I know and it's it's quite a controversial issue even within the like the sector that I'm trying to work in and the groups I'm trying to work in um and like I said before I think it's it's quite uncomfortable like a lot of people don't want to talk about it or acknowledge it so it's been it's been really hard work on that side of things and I think also because of that like online I've attracted a lot of like nasty people I suppose who don't like what I'm talking about so that yeah that's not fun but I think like it's kind of sad but it doesn't really bother me anymore because it's been years and I just think most of them are quite like sad people (laughs) I don't know it's of all the things that I could have picked to talk about I think I gave myself a very hard and a very long-term job (laughs) Oh, you did but but you're out there doing it making this making this change um happen you're an ambassador for bristol european green capital in in 2015 tell us more about your your role in that area 2015 was such an amazing year to be a bristolian because for people who don't know it was picked as european green capital which means that i think it's the eu or pe- people in europe have decided that bristol is like an outstandingly green city within like the whole continent for me being involved in that was so special because it was just a year of continuous conversation about green issues and like but also real action like things were changing and things were really being done all the time Um, and I think because it was so exciting so many more people than usual really got in on the action and were getting really involved in all these different projects you know there was just a really strong energy for change that year Uh, yeah I was really honoured to have been able to be part of that. Have you managed to sort of maintain the momentum from 2015 how do you work do you is it do you have like um, a a plan at the beginning of every year of what you're going to do what you're going to focus on Um, is it more ad hoc is it just waiting to see what happens do you do you plan or structure? Not gonna lie, I'm someone who's not very good at planning and I'm very good at procrastination. Like in school, I was always that kid like doing their homework during like break time. Um, But I think so it's always been like very ad hoc, just going with the flow, seeing like what issues are being talked about and how I feel that I can contribute to the conversation. But as I get older, it's very sad, but I've had to start planning things a bit more just because... Um, the kind of work that I'm doing is a lot more structured so for example the four camps that we were supposed to do this summer which obviously have been cancelled because of corona we've been planning for for months and months and months and we have to think about like you know all the more boring side of things like finance and paperwork and sorting all the little details out but in some ways I do think it's been like a really important learning curve for me just because it's a lot of responsibility you know and it's I'm learning loads and loads of stuff that I just never um, learned in school and I do feel like because of all of this I feel very independent and I feel very capable which is really nice. Absolutely I'd love to say what would be your advice and tips for for people who want to get into um, you know becoming an environmentalist you, you know taking more action to help develop change you know what what would be your advice and top tips I guess one thing would be that because we're living in this age of social media everyone has a voice you know and it's so much easier than it's ever been in the past to literally just stand up and start talking about the things that you care about and it doesn't matter whether you have like I don't know millions of followers on Instagram or not like I think 
it's really important that people do just talk about the things they care about, even if it's just to like their 10 mates that follow them. And I think also it's so important that people read loads and that people really think about like the news that they're consuming, where it's coming from, why there might be a spin on it. Because I think now more than ever, it's really important that people have an understanding of all the different stuff that's going on in the world because it can feel like a bit of a disaster at times like everything's going wrong all the times and it's time and it's awful to ever have to read the news but it's not it's okay it'll pass and I think just even giving yourself the opportunity to express your own views and opinions can feel it can feel very freeing especially as a young girl because I do definitely feel like um, women especially young women are uh, sort of constantly told that their views and their feelings and their opinions aren't quite as important and aren't quite as valued so I think as a young woman it's very important that you actively go and insert yourself into places even if people aren't like going up to you and welcoming you and saying come and talk to us because people won't necessarily but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be talking about things. How do you maintain your positivity and hope for the future? I think definitely like it's a bit of side effect of social media that everything can feel a bit miserable all the time and like the world is about to end but like constantly and I think for me it's been a massive learning curve understanding like what my boundaries are and when I have to stop and turn off and like separate myself from all the work that I'm doing because I, I guess it's just very important to value your mental health and to not burn yourself out because at the end of the day, like the work that you're doing will be so much more valuable if you can do it long term and sustainably, which isn't going to happen if you're not looking after yourself and taking breaks. Absolutely. And at least you can go and do your birding and get back out to nature. And um, One of the things I was reading on your blog as well is you've got your sea license at 16. Now, I have no idea what that means in the world of birding, but are there licenses that, that you get or levels that you, you go up? Like, how does that work? That's not quite birding. Like I said, birding is very freeform. Like, it's whatever you want from it, um, it can give you. But that is in reference to ringing, or I think it's called banding in the US as well. But it's basically like, this scientific process, the scientific study where you catch birds, wild birds, and you take different like measurements on, on them, like how much fat they have, how much muscle muscle they have, um, I don't know, how long their wings are, how much they weigh. And it's like a super long term study in different bird populations and bird movement. And it's called ringing because you put a tiny little band on their leg and it's got a unique number on it. So it means that if someone else finds it, somewhere else they can look the number up and be like oh wow that was in England last summer and now we're finding it in Sweden or whatever and from that we learn a lot about birds but because you're handling wild animals um, and you're like extracting them from nets and stuff like that and making sure that they're completely okay you have to get a license and yeah so that's what um, having a sea license means it means I've got the basic license in terms of ringing so I can go and do it by myself and the birds that I handle will be okay that's so awesome I love that yeah I love doing it so much it's so fun like I love just being able to hold wild animals in your hands it's such an amazing experience is the UK a good place for bird watching um I think it definitely is and I think even like native UK species and stuff are a lot more exciting than a lot of people think because even though they might not be as flashy as maybe some exotic tropical birds they're still very special and a lot of them are very interesting and I think also there's a lot more diversity within bird species that people um, realise if you go looking. I love a lot of different UK birds and one of my favourite which always surprises people is the wren which you will find in most headlines ever and it's like super common and super brown but I just love them I think they're great so I love UK wildlife but also because of where the UK is located like right next to the ocean and stuff we also get a lot of bird species being pushed over from America by like bad weather which is why twitching one of the reasons I think that twitching is quite 
popular here is because we get a lot of stuff being blown over. You're also um, a charter champion for the Charter for Woods, Trees and People. What, what does that mean? What do you do there? That's basically about advocating for trees and talking about how important trees are. And I've been like involved in that in a very long time. And it's quite fun because like when I started it, I felt like people weren't talking about trees that much and it like they were a very overlooked part of the countryside and I don't know they're not wildlife because they're plants but like the whole ecosystem of everything but I do definitely feel like the conversation around like the need for trees and stuff has grown a lot especially since I think it was last year that this article came out where it was talking about like the exact number of trees we'd have to plant to combat climate change and um, what area of space that would fill. And, you know, I, ju- I just felt like it was very important because I think they're great and I think they can be very overlooked here in the UK. Like, obviously, people talk a lot about um, logging and deforestation in other countries, but that same concern for, you know, our our countryside isn't always, like, applied in the same way. What are the plans for you, for you now? Are you taking a gap year? Are you going to be going to university in, in September? What's going to be happening? Um, well, I'm really pleased because I am taking a gap year and none of my mates are. And obviously then Corona happened. And even though I'm not going to be able to travel the places to the places that I was hoping to, I'm just going to have a lot more time to work and sort out Black to Nature and spend time with my friends, to be honest. And then next autumn, I'm hopefully, if I get the grades, going to be going off to study politics and international relations somewhere, which I'm like so excited for. I think it's so interesting. No, that's going to be absolutely awesome. Where are you planning to go on the gap year? Well, not going to lie, it wasn't super elaborate plans. And I'm so glad because I have one other friend who was having a gap year and she's like super organized she's the opposite of me and she'd like organized all her different trips already and um obviously all of this has happened now and I haven't organized anything um but I was hoping to go to Europe this summer because even though it's weird even though I've done a lot of traveling and stuff I've never really spent any time in Europe except like on a on a couple of school trips but then I was hoping to take the train to China this autumn which I don't think that's going to be happening either so and and apart from that I didn't really have loads of plans yeah it's oh it's 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 so sad like like (laughs) such such an important part of your of your life and and I suppose also would you have been going solo um yeah probably which I was actually really excited for I've never traveled by myself and even though like I feel quite comfortable in traveling like going around by myself still felt really scary but yeah that's none of that's happening anymore so yeah let's talk about your your campaigning journey that you've been on and how it's sort of evolved over the past five years and how maybe you've grown and developed as a person during that time at the start of this all just when I was starting my blog and stuff I was a lot more quiet um I'm not sure if my teachers would agree with me and stuff but I feel like I wasn't very prepared to um, get in any arguments or debates in class or assert my views or um, just be very confident in any way really and I think it's a thing that a lot of young girls do where you just sort of shrink and try to take up as little space as possible and for me it's been a massive journey in really learning to assert myself and be really confident in my views and who I am as a person for me that's been one of the most important things that's come out of all of this work that I've been doing I think it's been amazing for me to have had the opportunity to have grown like that really yeah I mean how do you find the public speaking side of things like you know having to stand up talk argue your point of view to get your views across and to and to be heard as well um I actually really enjoy a good debate now like I'm slightly infamous in my classes because if anyone starts a debate I have to win um (laughs) and I think like I said I feel very confident in asserting my views which I feel like always felt slightly subversive to me when I was younger because it was like I'm not supposed to be talking all the time and saying what I think about these things and I think nowadays I'm quite comfortable to be honest with public speaking and I'm very comfortable talking about what I think about things 
and um yeah I suppose it's massive life skills that I've managed to gain through all of this work I've been doing how do you deal with people who, who do have differing opinions to to your own and handle like the, the debates as such like do you have do you have a method so for me on social media um, I always try and promote what I love not bash what I hate but I do struggle with that a lot <laughs> um, <laughs> on trying to manage it because I, I actually I just really hate um I don't really like confrontation um mm. I don't like having those you know those sort of difficult awkward conversations I think part of me is just like why can't we all just get along but I know that that's not not the right answer how do, how do you handle all of that I mean to be honest in I feel quite comfortable talking to people about stuff and even though like and with on social media I'm, I'm not as nice as you I do post stuff that I disagree with to make points about things and start conversations and sometimes I do use that as a starting point to talk to people about um you know what they believe and why I think they're wrong um (laughs) but like you know just talking to them about like you know the thoughts behind things and what they believe and why I believe this um and I have changed people's minds in the past and I think even though it's very easy to just get swept away in a conversation that's purely aggression which I do sometimes where it's just like arguing rather than trying to prove a point I do think that sometimes there are there are like occasions where you can change someone's mind and I don't want to let one of those slip by so I do I do engage people online um yeah no I love it I think it's amazing I, I, I love what you're doing and, and, the, and the passion that you're bringing to it and I'd love to I'd love to know um Maya Rose where's the best place for people can where people oh, let me say that again Maya Rose I'd love to know where's the best place that people can find more information out about you and follow you online and yeah follow your journey the best place to follow me is probably just Twitter which my my username is birdgirluk But if you want to read some longer stuff by me, you can also check out my blog, which is just called Bird Girl. And there's a lot of information about Black to Nature and all my campaigning stuff and a few articles that I've written. Uh, Myra Rose, just maybe share final words of wisdom, final words of advice to motivate and inspire other women and girls out there to follow their passions and to follow their interests. What would you say? I think I'd just say the your opinions are valid and your voice is valid and even if there are people that want to make you feel small or belittled it's so important that people carry on starting conversations and carry on adding their voices to the mix because I feel like this world would be a lot blander and all these different debates would be a lot blander if like all these amazing young women and girls online weren't adding their voices and their opinions to the mix absolutely totally agree and my rose thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast to share more about your your passions and your interests it's been absolutely inspiring and i know that you will be a force for good um, with all of the work that you are doing thank you so much thank you so much for having me on this has been great Hey tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Maya Rose. What an absolute inspiration. Now, if you are interested in birds, I've got a fantastic Tough Girl podcast episode for you to listen to. Take a listen to Sasha Dench. She's also known as the human swan. So I spoke with Sasha on May 8th, 2018. So let me just tell you a little bit more about Sasha and what she's done. So Sasha is an Australian born conservationist, adventurer and motivational speaker. She works for the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust in the UK. And one of the things that she noticed was that over the past 20 years, Years, Berwick swan numbers have nearly halved, with there just being 20,000 remaining in the wild. But experts were unsure what's causing the population crash. So Sasha had this idea to investigate the problem. And after 18 months of planning, she decided to follow their entire 17,000 kilometer migration route from Arctic Russia to the UK. But how she did this was with a paramotor. So basically, essentially hanging from a paraglider with a propeller on her back. So during that podcast episode, 
So Sasha shares more about her life as being the human swan, her early years growing up, her passions for the environment and conservation, and shares more about this incredible journey from Arctic Russia to the UK. So I'd highly recommend you listen to that episode, and that is Sasha Dench. If you are brand new to the Tough Girl podcast, then please do go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com. We've got over 300 interviews with incredible women all around the world doing these amazing challenges. And they come on the podcast and share more about their journey, what they've learned. They give you top tips and advice to help motivate and inspire you with your own personal adventures and challenges. If you are enjoying the Tough Girl podcast and you've been motivated, inspired, I'd love for you to pay it forward. Tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. That would be amazing. Or share it on social media. Because like Myra Rose says, you do have a voice. You do have influence. So shout about the Tough Girl podcast from the rooftops on your social media. That would be absolutely amazing. But wherever you are, whatever you are doing, have an awesome day. Give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. And don't forget to subscribe to the Tough Girl podcast. All right, take care and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.